Thank you for joining us. I was, on a, I was on my way yesterday when Harriet was, was showing, but the reactions I was getting, I, got, I just got these waves of love for that movie. Who here was there yesterday? Excellent, great. We are going to be opening up uh, questions later, so if you have one burning, just know that or think about it while we're talking. Um, I wanted to just start at the very beginning, which is you and where you grew up and how film and the arts uh, played a role in your life early on. Um, I, uh, uh, forgive me, I'm a little congested this morning. Um, I grew up in St. Louis. I was born in St. Louis, and um, I was uh, an afterthought child. My, my sisters were older by many years, and I think that um, my parents' marriage had begun to fall apart mm -hmm. by the time I was conceived. Mm. And, um, and so um, my, it was a little bit um, turbulent, honestly. And so when they really were um, not getting along, my mother would send me to my grandmother's in Alabama, in Tuskegee, uh, which was a magical place for me. Um, it was a place away from their strife. And uh, I, it, there was something that I just really, really pulled me about that part of the South. Um, so my parents got divorced, and my mother moved to um, Boston to do her PhD at Harvard. And, uh, and so, you know, they're academics. Um, and uh, my sister wanted to be a doctor and, you know, go to medical school. And um, at that point, um, I don't know what I was interested in. I was a little kid, but my mother, I think, to keep me from um, being sad, you know, or gloomy, she, um, she enrolled me in Boston Children's Theater. I don't think she knew um, that I was going to be so smitten. Wow. But the first time um, I heard applause, <laughs> I was like, no, this is it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I'm in, you know. <laughs> I believe the term of art is I smell blood. I, really, I remember that's what Bruce Springsteen says in his memoir the first time he gets that reaction from his friends. So that was what age did you start? At, at the, eight. At eight. And so then a magical thing happened. So I was, I was maybe the, the was I, I was the only black girl in Boston Children's Theater. Maybe there were a, a few hundred mm -hmm. students. Um, and a show in town, a local show called You've Got to Write, which is like a courtroom drama, needed a little black girl. And um, so Elma Lewis, which was a famous school for African American kids, they sent every girl they had. But Boston Children's Theater was like, we have one, and they sent me. And I got the part. Wow. And, um, you know, shot for a few days. I played Catherine Cooper, the first black girl to integrate. You know, it was a courtroom drama, and I was the first black girl to integrate a school. And um, there were all these grown people around me. And uh, that, was, that was, that really cinched the deal. Yeah. And uh, when I was, um, when it was, when the show was wrapping, I was inconsolable. <laughs> and I couldn't stop crying. And um, Robert Louis Cheon, the producer, took out his handkerchief and gave it to me. And on it, he wrote to Karen, my birth name, to Karen, who will be a great actress one day. Oh, how f do you still have it? You know, it was stolen from Oh, me? for goodness sake, that's no spoil. But interestingly enough, we're going to jump ahead a little bit, because then when it's time to go to college, tell us what, what, what path did you take there? Oh, acting. Oh, and, okay, yeah, still yeah. acting. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, NYU School of the Arts, Tisch. Great. Studied at Circle in the Square. Oh, for um, some reason, I thought you went to, I, I read history somewhere. That you, well, I transferred. So after, and I think that had to do with the high school I went to. So I went to a very um, academically intense high school called Commonwealth outside of Boston. And uh, I think when I got to Tisch, I just wasn't ready to give that up. And so I transferred to UCLA and, and was, became a history, history major, sociology minor. But not a film major. Not, not yet. Not yet. But it, I mean, when you look back, even as an actress and an actor, were, were you directing in your head? I mean, were, was the... I think I was telling stories. And yeah. so that had been strong for me since I was 12. I'd written a novel, you know. <laughs> My cousin and I wrote a novel together. Um, so I'd been writing all my life. Right. And that was really strong for me. So in the way that I'm always, my husband says I look up and he just knows I'm, you know, if I look off. Then he, <laughs> knows, he, he knows that look. Yeah, he knows that look. I think I've always been doing that. You know, I was very introverted. I um, nearsighted, you know. Yeah. Um, creating your own world. Cr creating my own world all the time. 
But I, I decided um, <laughs> to go to film school. So I decided, I went back to New York yeah. and um, pursued my acting career, which was going well. You know? Indeed. It was going pretty well. Um, but I had time on my hands. I had a lot of time on my hands. So I um, actually, D.A. Penny Baker edited in my building. Oh my. And I used to look in at Penny Baker, you know. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to go to film school oh. and, uh, and, and, you know, go to, I don't know. I mean, I thought, I really thought um, I might go to Nicaragua and like, at that time that was really happening and put a camera on my shoulder and like do something meaningful with my life. Mm -hmm. So I went to film school and studied cinematography. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, very quickly I learned a lot about myself. So I tried to make a documentary on homelessness in New York. Um, but I wrote a voiceover to it, you know, I didn't, which I didn't know was against rules, right? <laughs> and, um, and so anyway, I got a lot of flack for it, but it also played, it also played at festival, my little tiny first film. And that would have been what year? 89. We're talking about the 80s, yeah. right. Yeah. So at this point in documentary film, it's true that there was, you know, that's when narrative was really coming on and, and Errol Morris was experimenting. And yeah. so those traditional techniques like voiceover were kind of, you know, yeah. but of course now you can do anything. I mean, it's, there really aren't any more rules. Well, I mean, it, it's, it showed, you know, which exactly. I had no idea. So this, I remember this man from Channel 4, you know, London uh, coming up to me and saying it really made me angry and I was like oh my god a guy from Channel 4 London is yelling at me I was, I was so uh, happy just to be <laughs> <laughs> to count enough to be angry yeah yeah, yeah exactly right so yeah I'm a, I, maybe I'm a filmmaker that's, a, that's exactly that's claiming space yeah. you know that's definitely claiming space but all but but it, and I think what, I would like to show a little clip I mean Casey did have this really great acting career I mean you were really on your way um, that all happened kind of at the same time. Uh huh. So that happened like in the, it was 89, I think. Right. So I had this little film from film school. I got Silence of the Lambs, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm like, hey, and, yeah, maybe I should move to Hollywood, you know? <laughs> let's show a little, do we have a clip of um, Silence of the Lambs? We just, I would love to see this. It's been a while, it's been a minute. <laughs> Special Agent Starling. Huh? Special Agent Man? <laughs> Phone call. Excuse me, Jim. Starling? Hilch, did you take our picture? <laughs> sure. Look, I just wanted to say congratulations. And uh, I'm not much good at this kind of thing, so I'm going to duck out of here. OK, sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Crawford. Your father would have been proud today. Don't forget your phone call. Starling. Wow, Clarice. Have the lamb stopped screaming? Doctor Lecter. Don't bother with the trace. I won't be on long enough. Where are you, Doctor Lecter? I have no plans to call on you, Clarice. The world's more interesting with you in it. So you take care now to extend me the same courtesy. You know I can't make that promise. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. Bye. Dr. Lecter. Dr. Lecter. Dr. Lecter. Very important. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Do you have the security system all set up? Oh, we have the big shot security. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Spike Lee school days. I did. Around this time too. So yeah. you were kind of, you know, well on your way to be doing, to, to be acting. 
Yeah, I mean, Spike was my, that was my first movie. Mm -hmm. By the time I did Silence, you know, I began to work a little bit more. Um, but it was like the, it was a, my first time doing, you know, any kind of lead. Right, right. So then, I'm going to jump ahead again to 1997 with your very first film, Eve's Bayou, which still to this day is, it's in the canon. I mean, it is rightfully so. Um, such a hugely important, indelible film. Um, tell us about sort of making that pivot. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had these stories in my head that kind of had to do with my family um, and kind of didn't. Um, kind of had to do with my aunt, I've got to say. She was the first one and then that I wrote a story about because she, she was a very fantastical person who had all these husbands and, you know, um, a very storied life and she was a psychic counselor. And I'd witnessed incredible things growing up with her. We were very close. And um, so I started writing stories about her and they became Eve's mm. uh, And um, you know, I, I wrote this script and I thought I was writing the great part that I would play one day, you know? Hey, foresight, you know, like I'm not always gonna fit in this dress and um, I would go to auditions and, you know, there were lots of us and I felt, um, I felt that there was nothing that special about me, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, as an actor, you know, I was lucky. I was good, I mean, I was, I was good. I was a responsible actor, right. you know? But I didn't know if I was ever gonna be like a great actor. Um, and I, uh, you know, I thought, well, I'll, I'll write a part for myself that I right. know, you know, I can play one day. And so I wrote this role with Ms. Elba Batiste in, um, in Eve's Body. And, uh, but I let my boyfriend read it, <laughs> who's now my husband, and he said, you have to show it to, to people. And I showed it to my acting agent, and he walked it down the hall to the liter literary department and showed it to Frank Williger, who's still my agent. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and we shocked it and, and you know, people were very interested and some people were, um, it made them angry. Tell me more about that. Uh, well, you know, we were kind of looking for an actor who, um, who might want to direct. You know, my, my agent wanted somebody, he kept saying, it's fine. you know, we, it needs to be sexy, like a sexy choice, you know. So we go to these to famous actors who might want to direct and they all turned it down. Um, and one person who I won't name uh, said, I don't want to see Nothing those people. Nothing leaves this room. I don't want to see those people on screen. And I, I, yeah, he said they're, you know, they're fighting, they're slapping each other. It's like hysterical. Oh. Um, you know, but, no. Um, but everybody took a meeting with me. That's the experience I had on these bikes. Like people wanted to meet me. You know, and so me just kind of happy to be in, you know. Right, be in the room. I woke up on my birthday and I said, I'm sexy. <laughs> like I just like, woke up like what what could be what could be cooler than the person that wrote it directing it? I should just you know and I pitched that to my agent who's like mm, and uh, you know and the producer who almost fell out of his chair. And then they got together the producer my agent and they funded a short film for me, which was Doctor Hugo. Like okay, forget those films you made in film school. Okay. If you're really serious. Uh, do a short film, 35 millimeter, like real, the real thing, and, um, and give us a taste of what that movie might feel like. And so I made a film called Dr. Hugo. And, um, and Sam Jackson saw Dr. Hugo and read the script and wanted to play that guy. I think Sam, Sam was um, I th Pulp Fiction. Sam was a wonderful character actor, but he wasn't like a romantic leading man mm -hmm. kind of guy right. at that point. And so he wanted to be Lou Batiste. Right, right. Let's see a clip of these by you. What did you do to your brother? I'm going to push him out of a window if I don't get out of this house. Eve! Cicely's been in the goddamn bathtub for an hour. You know that? She stayed in there three hours yesterday. Fortunately, there's more than one bathroom in this house. Ain't that much dirt in all Louisiana. Get out of the damn tub! You watch your language, young lady. Mama keeps stabbing herself in the kitchen. Show her your hands, Mama. I think you better hush. And where's Daddy? He's never home. He's supposed to be home sometimes. Listen, you little ingrate. Your father works hard so we can have a house with four bathrooms. Not every night he's not working. I know he's not. I'm, 
I mean... Let me borrow you for a minute. Poe? Is that your idea of being a good daughter? It's true. He never comes home and it's making her nervous. She cuts herself. Oh, and you're just being helpful bringing it up, is that it? She's nervous because he's messing with other women. What did you say? Nothing. Play games with me, I swear I'll slap you blind. It's true, I saw them. You saw who? You have five seconds. Daddy and Mrs. Moreau. It was at the party. I was out in the carriage house, and they didn't see me. And it was worse than just kissing. They were... Hush, was... hush, let me think a minute. Have you told anyone? No. Well, that's good. Because if you tell anyone, anyone at all, I'm going to kill you. And if you get careless again with your mama's feelings, I swear I'll do you harm. You understand me? Yes, ma'am. And is it Debbie Morgan's character that's based on your aunt? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just in it, this, this movie, the language of this movie was so vivid. Uh, both the dialogue, the written language, and the visual language, and just the sensuality of it, and the mystery, and the mysticism. Um, and it was really immediately recognized in my memory. I mean, you were, you were, you had arrived. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, I think that, that really people hadn't seen anything like that before. Right. You know, they, they, um. And they responded to it immediately. It's almost like it, it, it was like we wanted it. We didn't know we wanted it. And then it came and it was such a relief to have it. Thank God, yeah. And. So what is that like as a young, you know, so you, it, it feels like these were all things that you did, you know, you, you wrote that script almost as a career management right. technique, yeah. you know, to, to give yourself some safety for future. But then all of a sudden, boom, you're, you're you know, you, you've got this lauded movie that wins all sorts of awards and, and does very well. So was that, tell, put us in that spin cycle, was it just a whirlwind? It, it was a complete whirlwind. Um, I was at uh, TIFF and I uh, walked out of the screening and, and saw Roger Ebert and he looked at me, he looked me right in the eyes and he said, and I was like, wow. Okay, and he, he wrote really a gorgeous review um, that is, it still overwhelms me to the, part, to the point where um, I have a hard time reading the whole thing. Um, and that was, you know, it was amazing, but I, I really, really believed that I didn't have to do it again. <laughs> so you still thought, I'm going to be an act, you know, you were still thinking acting until I can't do it yeah, anymore. Yeah, I was like, you know, that's it, I've proven that. You know? Right. Um, yeah, I thought, um, I, yeah, I didn't necessarily intend to do it again. So then take us through the next few years of your, of, of um, your journey. Sam Jackson called me and said he had this script and did I want to take a look at it? You know, and I said, sure, and it was really interesting. And uh, so I decided to do that. And that was called The Caveman's the Valentine. Caveman's Valentine. Valentine. And we have a clip of that, too. Do we want to look at that? <laughs> That's some view. <laughs> You'll grace us? Oh. Oh, it's a nice detail, Bob. Uh, Bosendorfer. 36. Very good. Everything in here is from the 30s. Oh, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer. The uh, Depression was something of a golden era for my kind. Please, play something. Anything. I, 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 I really couldn't. Why not? Oh, honey, if he doesn't want to play. I want to know if he can play, honey. Please.
fight it, baby. Show Stuyvesant you're not scared of him. Play the damn thing. One hand-me-down suit coming up. That was wonderful. Why does it hurt you to play? That was another life. So, <clears throat> as an actor, I would imagine in this, and in that first scene in *Eve's Bayou*, we saw you working with Janae Smollett. You probably knew how to work with actors and, and talk and communicate with actors. Yeah, um, I, I knew what I liked. Right, and you could probably, I would imagine, that made your job a lot easier when you were working, you know, having been there. Mm -hmm. And then having, obviously, specialized in cinematography, you knew about image capture, but were the, that brings to mind editing, you know? I mean, were the, as you were kind of putting your style together and you're finding your own cinematic voice, were you bringing along lessons you learned from people like Spike Lee and Jonathan Demme? Or? Yeah, I mean, not in a conscious, and not in a super conscious way. But I did, I did have, I had worked with John Wu and Jonathan Demme and Spike Lee, yeah. and I, you know, worked with really amazing directors, and they each, I did take something from each of them. Um, particularly Jonathan, you know. Jonathan was very, um, he was focused and excited and upbeat. And um, I, I did think, you know, I want to be focused and excited and upbeat. Yeah. It's almost like you're establishing, you're establishing the tone. Yeah. You know, it, I've heard this often that, that the directors, uh, you know, when you to try to describe what does a director do, so much of it is the tone of what we see on the screen, but also the tone of the set right. and the work ethic and the kind of vibe. Right. Um, and that's leadership. That's really what it comes down to. And I, I can see how Demi would have been a really great role Some model for that, right. you know, because he exuded that kind of humanism on every, at every moment. Yeah. Um, and I want to skip ahead because I know I want to get to your, to your uh, questions. Then to talk to me in 2007, and I'm detecting these gaps in between movies, and I, I think on paper it looks like, you know, you were, I don't know, were you fighting all this time to get your movies made? But maybe not. Maybe I'm projecting. Well, no, I was fighting all this time to get my movies okay. made. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but I, did, I did have, you know, a couple of small children. <laughs> You know, so um, so there was that. You know, and I I love my children, and I um, yeah. you know it's it's very, children are very absorbing. Yes, they're great procrastination techniques. And, um, yeah. You know, so so uh, but I was fiercely trying to get movies made that whole time. Well, it's interesting. You know, when I watched Harriet, one of the the the, the most poignant aspects of it for me is to see that flourishing middle class in Philadelphia. Um, and it reminded me of, of then, it kind of projects out to Reconstruction and that time of promise and prosperity and, and of course that is just immediately meets a backlash. And I feel like a similar thing happened in the 90s with black filmmakers, like there was this renaissance and you were a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it didn't quite sustain. And I'm wondering, again, is that my, a correct interpretation? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, I, I I was so optimistic, you know, that um, that I wasn't going to be um, alone. I mean, there were a few of us, but it was such a small group. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you know, wonderful things happen. Spike would be at Cannes, and we're like, oh my God, the doors are going to open, and there's just going to be this tsunami of of filmmakers of color and women, you know. And it didn't really happen. Yeah. And what was it like from the inside? I mean, is it just that the, you couldn't get the meetings, or you were was were you hitting a particular wall? At a particular yeah, the, the wall that I was hitting um, specifically was called um, "Black Movies Don't Sell Foreign," mm -hmm. 
Like I came to black hate doesn't those, travel. I I hate those words. I can just like it, it makes my skin crawl. But I heard it over and over again. You know, black movies don't sell foreign. Um, you know, black dramas don't sell. Same. I heard the same thing as a critic at the mm -hmm. time because I was covering. I was working for the Baltimore Sun, mm -hmm. in a city. You know, with a majority yeah. black audience that was hungry for these narratives and trying to explain okay. why aren't we seeing these? And they would do beautifully well. You know, when they did come out. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then there was all sorts of, I think also specious things about crossover. Right, yeah. Um, and it, do you sense that that's, those are breaking down now? I mean, do you think that's, are we, oh, have I we do. finally gotten over that? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that we've proven that the box office is there. And, and you know, look, it's a business. And, yeah. um, but also, I think that finally, you know, it's cool. You know, first, first business-wise, it's been proven. Right. You know, over and over again, over and over again. Right. Um, but also, I think you know, it started to be kind of cool. Like people are looking for, finally, right. Women and 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 filmmakers of color and filmmakers from diverse backgrounds. Right. Those voices. Um, it it really struck me watching the Oscars this year. Just the people going up on that stage, and these are below the line. You know, these aren't the names. These are these are Ruth, you know Ruth Carter and Hannah Bleachler, and I mean it just felt so like this is what movies look like. It's amazing. And we can maybe get rid of the qualifiers. I would love it if we could not niche everybody out so would, much. One day that would be really nice. Yeah. Um, I noticed that Eve's Bayou. Somebody named it one of the twenty five most. I can't, you know, influential films, black film, you know, and I was like, no, it's an American, it's about the American experience. You know, if we could, it can be both. Yeah. That's why, that's why um, the National Archives was so meaningful to me, you know, um, that we were inducted this past year into the National Archives. And, right, like, the Library, Library of Congress, Congress, National Registry, and, right. Um, and that was, um, that, it was amazing, you know. Right. I was really um, super honored and excited about it. Right, right. Um, we have another, we have a talk to me clip, but I want to get, are there questions? I just want to see some hands if people are just itching, itching, itching to get into this. I don't want to, yes, go ahead. I just have one quick question about Silence Hill. Yeah. <laughs> Since Jody also, you played, you were her friend in the movie, yeah. you had these great scenes with just the two of you, which is actually one of the things we but um, since she also became a filmmaker, did, right. when you were talking as actresses, did you both have a sense that you both wanted to go in that you know, we kind of did. I remember one conversation that I had with her where we both talked about um, filmmaking, and you know, yeah, we de and de we definitely did. Have you stayed? In, do you stay in touch? Do you cross paths? We cross paths. I we don't really stay in touch, but we're always super happy to see each other. Yeah, yeah. It's very meaningful when you you know to have those long term. You know, when you make these journeys. Yeah. As yeah. contemporaries, it's it means it means more going on, you know, it means more and more as yeah, we it was, go on. It was great. I mean, it was such a warm, and we have such warm feelings for Jonathan, you know, yeah. the late great Jonathan. Indeed, Demi, yeah. indeed. indeed. Um, so let's talk about Talk To Me. Close to my heart is the is in D.C. You know, we, we loved it in D.C. Tell us, how did you come to... to... Um, I, I got approached to write a script. So, so this whole time that I'm trying to make movies, um, I'm not starving, I'm working as a writer. Yeah. So I've written maybe 50 screenplays. Gotcha. And so I, some of those movies I would try and get made as a director, and um, that's when I would run against. Um, but in terms of developing things, which I did think that it was um, still kind of an interesting thing for studios to be developing projects mm -hmm. all the time. You know, um, for, and maybe that was for appearances, you know. I don't know, but, but I worked. Right, it kept you it kept employed. Me, it kept yeah. me working. So I got a call from um, Mark Gordon, a producer. Mm -hmm fabulous producer, and he um, wanted me to take a look at a script and, um, you know, kind of fix the female characters and do a little rewrite of it. And I read the script, and I liked it very much, you know. Um, it, was, it was very rich, and I thought, okay, well, you know, I can work on it a little bit. Um, but it was, already, it was already quite good. And so I worked on the script, and um, I started listening to Sly and the Family Stone and working on the script, and... Um, and one day I called my agent and I said, you know, it's like falling, exactly like falling in love. And that's the way it always is for me. You know, like you're looking at somebody and you're like, okay, they're nice. And, you know, you have lunch and then one day you can't breathe. That's the way it is for me with a movie. So one day I couldn't breathe and I'm like, you know, what's this feeling in my chest? 
and I called my agent, I said, I think I have to direct this or I'm gonna die, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so I was no place on their list of directors. Um, it just hadn't, it hadn't occurred to them they were out to Clint Eastwood, you know? Wow. And um, so, so uh, <coughs> you know. And how do you, how do you win that fight? Do you campaign and you know? I, I waited for everybody to pass and, um, and my agent would keep reminding them that I wanted a meeting. But my sister actually joked, you know, first they went to all the white men, then they went to all the white women, and then they went to all the black men, oh, then they went to all the Indian women. <laughs> it, was really like, it, was, it was really like they went, you know, like I, you know, finally um, I got a meeting, and but I was so, nobody's ever been more prepared for a meeting than I was for that meeting, you know. I mean, I, like, I stood on the table, I think I literally stood on the table and, and um, danced to the music. I had music and I was, you know, it was a very upbeat meeting. So what you're trying to convey is your tone, like the tone that you're going to give this material and your approach. Um, and I guess, I don't know, you know, there are, now we have things like mood boards right, and things exactly. like that. But I mean, these are all ways to kind of communicate your vision to these suits that are going to... I just, it was just me and some music, you know. <laughs> and, um, and they were like, we're in. Great. Yeah. Let's see a clip of this. This is a really fun one. I bet he could name it. He could name it. He's not in the caveman's Valentine. Oh, he's not in the caveman's Valentine. Let's full disclosure. Yeah, he's my husband. He's Casey's (laughs) husband. (laughs) Might as well just say it. (laughs) Tell us about directing your your spouse. Is that does that come with an interesting dynamic or any rules? He he says I um I look at him differently. Really? Yeah, he says he comes on set and I look at him all like from a dis you know like as an actor you know an object clinically in a way um, you know. I just think, um, no, because I, I, they're never objects to me. I have deep love for actors, but it's a more, clini- it's a more clinical distance. Exactly. Technical, maybe, too. Yeah. Do you have rules about like not bringing work home? And I, you know, certain no rules. No rules. Well, it's obviously worked beautifully because you have a very long, 30-year-plus like, marriage now. Well, I mean, he's a great actor. Yes, he is. And um, so... You know, basically, when I write a script, I kind of give it to him and say, you know, baby, do you see a part for yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't talk to me. He really surprised me. Because he said, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm Sonny Jim. And I was like, you're way too cool to play Sonny Jim. He's so corny. And he said, I think I'm Sonny Jim. And he's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, and I think you can, you know, when they're that good, they know their range. And they, <clears throat> they know the boundaries to push and what would be, you know, like, so you're lucky that you're married, you know, you're lucky that your husband's a good actor. Yeah. Like, how awkward would it be if he weren't? (laughs) That would be so It would be really awkward. It would be kind of like, honey, I just read a script, but um, I'm not ready for you to look at it. Yeah, exactly. I'm not really quite in your your wheelhouse. Um, forgive me if I cover territory you covered last night at the Q&A, but I was fascinating to learn because I, because casting is so important with a movie, as you have shown in all of these films. You've been a very astute um, eye for talent and, and 
marrying actors to roles, but Cynthia Erivo for Harriet came attached. She did. She, she, I knew that they had been talking to an actress. Um, now, um, it's possible that I, couldn't, I could have sat down with her and we could have not gotten along, but that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. Also, by the, t by the time I met Cynthia, I, I, I was very focused on um, the opportunity to rewrite this, to really dig in and, and um, dig into the research and, and find, find it, you know. And tell us about that, I'm, you know, because this is a script that had been around for a while, yeah. right? And people had, you know, it, it, had, it had gone through some motions. And then when you got a hold of it, tell us what, you, what it needed and what you thought it needed, what you gave it. I mean, he would, Gregory was so ahead of his time with this idea of like, uh, you know, a uh, black woman superhero Harriet Tubman. Exactly. Um, so that was, that was what his script was. Right. Um, however, I don't even think that some of the great scholarly works have been written yet, you know, about her. So, uh, you know, th I, that's, that's what I imagine yet, you know, because right. he didn't have, um, there wasn't enough Harriet, you know. It was, it was, it was a, more action. It was like more a movie. woman that happened to be Harriet. As opposed to I the see. Harriet Tubman story, the actual specific, yeah. you know, the specifics, and I, re I really did not know what a big role religion played in her activism. I didn't either, um, and so that was like a, that's what you're referring to is that that was stuff that came out that had been everything in her family. Planned. The family stories were were better than fiction. Mm. That's what I thought. I thought the real thing was better than fiction. So why make it up? Just, just make it the Harriet Tubman story. Exactly. Um, and what I love, you know, it, it, something that had already always kind of bothered me about our Rosa Parks narrative was like the, the little old lady on the bus who got tired. Right. <laughs> and it was just this great way to completely de, you know, leech her of her activism and her, and her, and her agency. I think it happens over and over again. And I call it the fuzzification of African American heroes. You know, the softening of the edges of African American heroes. I think it happens over and over with King. Yeah. Um, who was absolutely, um, but you have to understand the radicalism of loving your enemy, you know. That's right. That, that's an The toughness of it. You know, the toughness of it. It's what, badass. The steeliness of it. Exactly. But, um, but with Harriet, you know, I mean, Harriet was down for the fight, you know, and so I really, uh, you know, I appreciated that about her. She, she had a quote, you know, I prayed to God to make me strong enough to fight. And, um... I thought that was badass. Yeah. You know, I prayed to God to make me strong, not to give me strength, but to make, make me strong. Right, make me strong. Me enough to fight. And mm -hmm. that's what I pray for every day. Yeah. No, I, thought, I... Wow, that, you know, that's, that's kind of cool. And, and Cynthia embodies that. I mean, right. she's such a muscular <laughs> performer and so compact and athletic. And, you know, it's just a wonderful reframing of this narrative again that we've been kind of fed all these years that sentimentalizes her and right. and makes it safe and kind of you know mm -hmm. warm and fuzzy that's right. a great word for it fuzzification i think um i think we might have been we might need to get people off to their movies but before we go well there's one great story and for, again i don't want to make you repeat from last night but there's this there's a shot in the film when she's crossing the Delaware River, the, and it was filmed in Virginia, right? I mean, it was all in this in, uh, in and around. But something kind of extraordinary happened the day that you that you filmed that scene, if I'm not mistaken. The the the, it, the thing you might be referring to is her crossing into freedom, right? I'm not sure. It, uh, extraordinary thing has happened all the time, um, but one of the most uh, like one of the most crazy things in my career happened when she crossed into freedom. Uh, Tell us about it. Okay, so it had been raining. You know, we, okay, you're a director, so you time of day, getting the location, you know, and you got to get the actors and the crew to the place to shoot the thing, right? So um, I needed something very specific and beautiful for her cross into freedom. And um, we, we get up that morning and it's pouring. I mean, pouring, horrible, horrible. And, uh, you know, we get to the location where we have many, much, much to shoot that day. And um, we're shooting the rain and the mud, which wasn't Harriet. That was normal for us. But um, this day, kind of where it was in the movie, maybe we were about a little more than halfway through. And, you know, there's always a day where um, 
you know, you, you smell mutiny a little bit. Like, yeah. you, know, you try to keep the crew with you, but there's always a day where people are just in a bad mood. It was just one of those days. And I was rushing them. And then Cynthia did not, there's a big arc in Harriet. For those of you who saw it, um, you, you remember, but she's, she's Minty, then she's Harriet, then she's Moses, right? And she didn't like going back and forth between Minty and Harriet in the same day. Okay, but this day she had to do that. So, um, and it required all, the, she had many costume changes. I was just rushing people. And at a certain point, um, even the, the first AD and the line producer were like, you know, you're not gonna get that. You know, and we should just bail and cut our losses. And I'm like, no, we're going to the top of the hill. You know, we're going to the top of the hill. And I'm calling hair and makeup in the trailers and begging them to have her up there on time. And we, they can't get the trucks up, it's too muddy. So we, we walk up in the rain and um, we left the crane there, thank God. So the crane was there, so we build the crane. And, um, and I get this call, Cynthia's ready. I'm like, she's ready. <laughs> and I know she's defiantly like, you know, all right, then I'm just gonna, you know. So um, I'm praying that the crane gets built before she comes, because if she has to wait for us, you know, that's not gonna be good. So as she gets to the top of the hill, the crane is built. And at that moment, the sun breaks through the clouds. It was crazy. One take at sunset, which we were playing for sunrise, and the sun broke through the clouds. A double rainbow is behind us, and Harriet walks into freedom. Yeah. It was... <laughs> Everybody burst into tears. Everybody spontaneously burst into tears. And I'm talking grips. Like, I'm talking guys that are not. John Toll, who John, I don't know if you know who John Toll is, is a DP. Um, I had the pleasure to work with. He's got a couple of Oscars. He's been, he's been, he's, he's a great, one of the yeah. greats. He's not what I would call crusty, but this dude has been around, right? <laughs> um, he, uh, he's watching the monitor and he giggles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just, it was an amazing moment. It was one of the great moments. And, and um, you know, one take and we had it. Wow. Well, it's a sanctified production. Thank you for sharing it with us. And thank you for sharing your thank time you. with us.